Thank you for being with us today. We would love to have you join us in person. To partner with us or to give online, go to www.upperroomohio.com. We hope you enjoy this message. lot I want to give to you. I feel like God is doing a lot on the planet, and all I want to do is just give it a little bit of context. And I want to really, I want to hone in on the fact that God is, we are, I said, I said it last year, if those of you, how many of you were there last year, here last year and heard my message? We talked about the three reformations, correct? So what we're going to do is we're going to expand on the third reformation. So if you weren't here last year, I'll have to write a book and you can buy it, okay? But if, but otherwise, the reality is, is that we are in the greatest single reformation in all of church history, okay? The short version is, in 1517, we saw the first reformation, which was the word. 1906, we saw a second reformation, which was power. And the third reformation begins this year, and it is called family, okay? Like, we are saying it begins this year because we believe that our Wittenberg moment, that our, our Azusa Street moment is coming right now, and the manifestation of this move of God is that God is doing a reformation. Do you understand what a reformation is? A reformation is we are reforming something back to what it's supposed to be. And we are reforming the church to look like family. Not just have a family language, but actually look like a family. Because out there, they're not interested in your signs and your wonders. They're interested in whether or not you actually like them. And we are training people all over the planet how to pray for the sick, but they still can't balance a checkbook. <laughs> that's, that's actually a problem. They're so convinced they are royalty, they won't go flip burgers for minimum wage. That's called entitlement. Yes, you are royalty. Go get a job. But I'm anointed to preach the gospel. Awesome. Do it while you're flipping burgers. Do it while you're pouring coffee. Do it while you're living a normal human life in the context of family. See, because we are teaching them how to move in power and move in the gifts, but they don't know how to move in family, so there's no context, so there's high burnout. Because the signs and wonders and manifestations of the Holy Spirit cannot exist in the context of an organization long term, but they can last generationally in the context of a family. So how do we get to it? Like, that sounds like a lot of jargon. Thank you so much for a lot of words. I appreciate your words. But let's get to the meat. Amen? I want to get to the practical. Let's walk this out. But for those of you that have heard me preach, some of this, I'm, you all can't see this. I should go up there, huh? Okay. I hate being on there, but I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. All right, I'm doing this. Okay. Holy Spirit, help me, because I want to be able to get this to you in a way that both, isn't it awesome that the Holy Spirit is the convictor and the comforter? I love that. He's the convictor and the comforter. He knocks you down and picks you up. It's so great. I love that. I love that. I love that he actually, he actually is the one who literally is going to convict your heart and then give you a hug while he's telling you you're doing a bad job. It's okay. You're not very good at that. You should start over. Okay. What just happened? That's how you know you've really encountered the Lord because you're changed, you're convicted, but you feel okay about it. By the way, that's also what like produces humility. When we become a people who aren't convinced of our rightness, but we actually are convinced of our loved, we'll convict the world of what we really believe, which is family. We have got to begin to walk this thing out in a tangible way. So this is going to be... A lot of drawing, okay? And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to start. Some of you have heard some of this message, some of these messages, and I'm going to put them all into context. This is the first time this weekend I felt like the Lord downloaded how all this fits together, and so I'm giving it to you. This is the only the second time I preached it. I preached it last night, and I, was, I had so much fun doing it. I'm going to do it again tonight, okay? Only in Ohio. All right. So what do we begin with? God. The entire thing is about God. Beginning, middle, and end is about God. This entire story, this entire Bible, this entire existence is about God. In the beginning was done. End of story. In the end, there is God. In the middle, the story is about 
we have got to understand that we are not the center of this story. When we were created, we were birthed into a story that was already a billion years in progress. And he didn't make you first and then ask your opinion about how the rest of it should go. Yet we live from a place where we think that this is a democracy. We are convinced that Christianity is a democracy and I get a vote. No, you get a voice, not a vote. There's a massive difference. I have access to the throne room where my voice will be heard, but my vote doesn't count because he is the one who knows how this is supposed to play out. See, that's the beautiful part. My kids can come and voice their opinions to me. Some of it will impact my heart and transition the way I do things. But at the end of the day, I know where this has to go. And all I can see is five minutes into the future. No, you have to go to school. You have to brush your teeth. You have to eat healthy. You can't have a soda for breakfast. And you can't wash it down with ice cream and caramel sauce. <laughs> but because I'm telling them no to do those things, am I a good father or a bad father? I'm a good father. Why? Because I know if they do that consistently, they'll get sick, they'll get diabetes, and they will die early. What about a God who you're crying out to him? And he says no. Paul says it this way. I cried out to the Lord that he would take this thorn from me. And what did he tell Paul? What, was he not a good enough apostle? Was he not a good enough preacher? Was he not a good enough disciple? Was he not a good enough evangelist? Did he not move in enough signs and wonders? No. The issue is he responds because God knows that it is the very thing that's keeping him humble. What if the very thing you're asking God to take away is the one thing he won't remove so that you actually become the person you were always created to be? That's a hard message to swallow. But it isn't as hard if you know he's the center of it and he is good. And he is right. And the way he does things always works out for those who seek his face. What is the pursuit of your life? Here's the, the real trick. You guys have heard some of this. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? You are such good Christians. Congratulations. You're now members. Okay, so eternal life. But what is eternal life? We've, con we've convinced generations that eternal life is what? Heaven. But Jesus himself disagrees with you. Because John 17 says, now this is eternal life. To know God and Christ Jesus whom he has sent. That is the pursuit of our life. See, we're not supposed to initiate people into heaven. We're supposed to initiate people into a relationship with God. We're getting people to bow their heads, close their eyes, and say yes to heaven. But they don't know how to say yes to God. Because to say yes to God means that he is Lord, he is all, he is everything. <laughs> He's everything. And your entire life is based around this one thing, the knowledge of God. That's what you're living for. What's my job? This. What should I be doing? This. Do you want to know what the will of God is? I've done this before here. The will of God for your life is the same for every single human person. Every person that has ever been born and ever will be born, the will of God is exactly the same. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. That is the will of God for your life. Yeah, but what am I supposed to do? No, do that. Well, no, no, I know we're supposed to do that. But then what do I do? No, do that. No, no, no. I, okay, Jake. Okay, okay. I get it, but then what am I supposed to do? No, do that. But then once I do that, when, then what do I do? Nothing. Your first job in creation, when it was day seven after you were created, what was your first job? Nothing. Now let us rest. What about Psalms? Be still and what? So what's the beginning of getting to know him? Stillness. Can I give you a tool? You want a tool for doing this? I'll give you a tool. All right, you guys ready? It's going to be a very easy tool. This is your first tool. It's very, very practical. You can write this down. It's called Revelation by Meditation. See, we gave meditation up to the New Age folks when it was ours first. <laughs> 
Oh, brother, I don't meditate. I pray. No, there's a difference between meditation and prayer. There's to they're totally different, completely different, and they're both necessary. He wants to transform and renew your mind. This is how he's going to do it, okay? So if your quiet times can't last more than 15 minutes, I'm about to help you out. They're going to last two hours, I promise you. They're going to help. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to split a piece of paper into four sections. So you should have one, two, three, and four, okay? I'm going to make this really fast, but I want to make it practical so that way you know how to begin to pursue the knowledge of God. I want you to begin to have some tool when you leave here to go, where do I start, okay? Where do I start? Because if you want me to be really honest, the very first place we start, number one, is the same place every move of God starts. It's called repentance. It says of Azusa Street, and it said the same thing in Brownsville. The moment the tears stopped, the revival stopped. This is where it begins and ends. Because the closer you get to him, the, realize, the more you realize you don't belong there. Even though he keeps saying, come. So, how do we get to know him? Once we get to this, and we've got step two going on over here, where do we start? Okay, what is this box for? You're going to write a verse up here in the start, okay? You're going to write a verse. Take your pen, your writing utensil, your piece of paper, and let's just write John 3.16. What verse? Any verse. Just one verse. Not five verses, not six verses, not a chapter. One verse. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That's what we're going to use because we're already on it, okay? Now, what you do is you shut your computer off. You get rid of every other book. Get rid of your cell phone, and you're going to sit there. How long? Start with one hour. Why? Because you want to get to the end of your flesh and the beginning of the spirit. See, most of us get bored with our quiet time, and the moment we get bored, we, on, we automatically move on. But the goal is to get to the end of your flesh and then push into the spirit. Okay, so one hour is usually a good amount of time for people to get into that thing. And you're like, dude, I don't have one hour. No, I promise you, you can find it. And I'm asking you to do it for 30 days. Super practical. One month, one hour a day. That's all I'm asking for you to do this. But I can promise you, the moment you start using this, one hour will not be enough. Okay? So John 3.16, get rid of the books, get rid of the Bible, get rid of everything else. You don't need the Bible, you don't need any of that because you have it written right here, okay? Now, here's what you're going to do. You're going to start because everybody knows this part right here is called the brain dump. That's the official term. Brain dump. Because you guys, you and I both know that the second you start a quiet time, what, do you, what happens? Oh, man, I forgot to make that phone call. That email. That thing is not done, and I need to get it done right this second. Here's the great news. This tool is amazing. Guess what you're going to do? Write it down. And then write another one down. And another one comes to your mind? Write it down. Guess what happens when you're done with your hour? They're still there. <laughs> I know. This is deep stuff. Your deep is crying out to deep right now, okay? Now, right here, further study. Let's get, let's get, boom, let's get to number three. Because some of you, you're not wired to be distracted like this. You're focused. You're teachers, you're pastors, and leaders. So what happens to you is you start your quiet time, and you go, for God so loved. Love, love. I wonder what the Greek word for love is. I wonder how many times the word love is in the New Testament. Does G how many times does Jesus say the word, and who does he say love to? And then all of a sudden, your quiet times turns into this study where you're literally spending four hours on Blue Letter Bible, and by the time you're done, you don't even know what you started studying. I have a box for you, too. You want to study love? Study it later. This is not Bible study. This is meditation. So if you want to study, just write it down here. What is the Greek word for love? How many times did Jesus say it? What else is there? Blah, blah, blah. Just write it down. And again, guess where it'll be when you're done? It's a genius tool, people. Seriously. Are you amazed yet? We haven't even gotten to the good stuff. Here's the good stuff. Okay, step one. What are you going to do with this verse? You are first going to read it. You are going to read it by looking at the words, saying it out loud so that you engage with your eyes, engage with your ears, and engage with your mouth. Okay? So you're going to read it. How many times? I don't know. A thousand. Who cares? All right? Just start reading it. Now, this isn't law, and you don't have to do it in this order. I'm giving it to you in this order. Do it however you want. Okay? Read it. Guess what you're going to do after that? You're going to 
write it. Now you're getting your body involved. But here's what's awesome for all of you doodlers. You're going to do this. For God so loved. Oh, look at There's a little heart there. He loves. And then I'm going to take that heart, and there's a flower up here. He loves God. God so loved. He so loved the world. And you're going to spend literally 30 minutes doodling this verse. You're going to draw it. You're going to write it. You're going to engage with it. Some of you are just literally going to write the most perfect letters like architects or something because that's your mindset, and that's okay. How many times should you write it? Again, I don't care. A thousand. Start with that. Junior high punishment becomes the glory of God. <laughs> Read it. Write it. Then guess what you're going to do? Say it. So we went from getting our eyes, our ears, and our mouth involved. Then we got our bodies involved. Now we're going to get our minds involved by saying it out loud. We're going to begin to declare it because what are we doing now? We're memorizing it and we're writing it on our hearts. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. This is good stuff. And we just start doing it. And if we have to keep glancing back at our paper, we keep glancing back at our paper and put it down. Until we have it memorized. Then, number four, this is going to be some people's favorite. I know it. You're going to sing it. Yeah. Others of you are like, not a chance. Because it's going to sound like this. You know what the best part about my kids are? Is that they love singing. And they're just not that great at it half the time. <laughs> you know why? Because they haven't become professionals yet. See, it actually takes no faith for someone like me to sing these verses. Why? Because I know how to sing. Guess how much faith it takes for some of you who don't like singing and don't like your voice. You're now operating in a realm of faith that says, I'm doing this for my father and not for myself. Here's the best part, I think. You're singing in your, your, you're singing in your room. For God so loved. And you're going to get to heaven one day. And your father's going to look at you and say, hey, I love your voice. Hey, sing me that song about John 3.16 again. And you're going to go, oh, this is awkward. I don't remember it. <laughs> and your dad's going to say, I do. Let's sing it together. Because we're singing his words back to him. And that takes us to our next part. Step five, the last step. We are going to pray it. God, you so love the world. I admit right now, I don't love the world the way you do. I want to love like you. Can you help me? Teach me, Jesus, how to love in the same way that you love. God, I ask in, in Jesus' name that you would teach me to love because I want to love the world. I want, I want to understand love. I want a revelation of love. I want to see love. I want to experience love. And I want to be loved the way that you're loved. Do you see how all of a sudden you just took a simple thing you've heard? Look, it took me 10 minutes to describe it. You've, I've already gone over some of your longest quiet times just explaining it. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you get involved? Now, guess what? If you do this for a year, how many songs are you going to have? How many prayers are you going to have? How many verses are you going to have memorized? How much personal revelation are you going to have? You know what we call that? That's called the secret place. Guess who can take this from you? No one. They can take your ministry. They can take your 501c3. They can take your building. They can take your car. They can take your house. But they can't take your personal encounters with Jesus Christ. Now, we got a problem. Don't worry, it's just the first one. Guess who's over here? Me. And guess what I am? I'm a sinner. 
and I'm broken. Anybody? You're like, dang, that's true. That is true. I'm a hot mess. See, what's crazy about it is in sort of a royalty, sonship, adoption culture, we end up forgetting that we actually got saved. We end up thinking we deserved to be here. You don't deserve to be here. What we deserve is hell. That's what we deserve. That's actually what we deserve. And you know what the truth is? When I say that out loud, most of us start to get uncomfortable. Well, you don't know. I'm a good person. I don't care if you're a good person. You are a sinner who needs a savior. You are in desperate need of a savior. You cannot save yourself. A drowning man cannot save himself. And drowning men drown other people who try to save them. Which is why so many people in the church are dying alongside, alongside those who are dying. Because instead of handing them Jesus, we're handing them ourselves and we end up drowning with them. Because you cannot save anyone. None of you. None of us have the ability to save. It is only Jesus Christ. And we're creating program after program to get Jesus out of the way and get ourselves in the mix so that we feel successful. Look at how many salvations I've had. You've had zero. That's how many you've had. And all the people who prayed the prayer, what if we made you, what if we made it so that you're not allowed to say how many people prayed the prayer until 10 years later and see if they're still walking with Jesus? How many people would be so bold to declare their numbers then? Well, brother, just this week, a million people got saved. Congratulations. Wait for 10 years and let's go see who's actually saved. That makes us uncomfortable. Why? Jesus never had an altar call. <laughs> How many churches did Jesus plant? One V church. That's it. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm going to blow up everything we talk. Trust me. It's, we're just getting warmed up because here's why. I don't have to impress you, and I don't want you to believe me. I want you to search the word of God and find out for yourself what's actually true and stop buying into systems that somebody handed you and you just believed that it was the way it was supposed to be. Well, it's just always going to be this way. No, it is not. It's not. It's not going to be this way forever. We need Jesus. We desperately need Jesus to get involved in our daily life and not just one decision. I need him every day. We are daily being saved. We are daily being renewed. We are daily being transformed into his image. I mean, Paul ends up saying, yeah, I must, I'm like the worst of all sinners. Why? Because he felt bad? Was he boo-hooing? Was, was, was he condemning himself? No. He was saying, the closer I get here, the more I feel like I don't belong. Like, tell me you didn't, tell me you haven't experienced this in worship. Sometimes all of a sudden you're worshiping and you're like, oh my, wow. Whew. I don't belong here. Well, the beautiful part about the blood of Jesus is that he removes those as our identity and he calls us sons and daughters. But the gap here is a gap called love. And see, love is always a choice. Because what began in a tree ended on a tree. But both are a choice. In the garden, it was a choice. And now today, the cross is a choice. And the problem with the way we do things and the way God does things is he says the road is how big? How big? Then why are we making it so wide saying that everybody who prays a prayer gets in?
I'm just asking questions. Please let me ask them. And please, uh, if you get offended and hurt, I'm not, that's not my heart. Please do not hear my heart in that. Please don't hear me trying to offend you or hurt you. What I'm trying to do is shake it all out. I want to shake it all out so that we can get to the things we actually want to do. Because the road is narrow and we are so busy trying to make the road wide instead of focusing on the ones who are already in. Do you see what Jesus does? He feeds the 5,000. They all follow him to his quiet time. And instead of amassing a church, he offends them all and sends them away. That is the most ridiculous evangelism strategy I've ever heard. Don't worry, you all got food, saw signs and wonders, praise God. I go away to a quiet place, you all return, and I should go, don't worry, it's time to plant the first church of me. And he goes, no, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, woo, dog, I ain't that hungry. And they like walk away. And they all walk away. And then he doesn't even explain what he just did to his own disciples. He said, are you going to leave me too? They say, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. He goes, good, then let's keep moving. No explanation. You guys, we're explaining things that God himself doesn't explain. We have theologies about stuff that God never touches. In fact, check this out. The woman caught in the act of adultery. Okay? She is naked in the middle of the street. They say she deserves to be stoned. First of all, here's the craziest part about that story. She deserves to be stoned. And Jesus says these words. What? He says, he who is without sin can cast the first stone. See, the crazy part about Jewish law is you couldn't condemn someone for something you had done yourself. So they all walked away. And now he has this naked woman sitting in front of him. And he says these words. We have a deliverance ministry down the street. I would love for you to come to it. It's really beautiful. It's five steps to freedom from a Jezebel spirit. Then I'd like you to go through a sozo. And then I'd like you to attend our small group on a regular basis. And then after that, if you could just attend our church, it would be really great if you could become a member because we'd really like to follow up. Could you fill out this card? What does Jesus say to the woman in adultery? Hey, um, hey, I don't do that anymore. That's his big strategy. Hey, don't, don't do that anymore. That's the end of the story, church. That's the end of the story. We are trying to walk people through processes Jesus himself did with a phrase, grace. Why? Because Jesus trusts the Holy Spirit for things we trust ourselves for. <laughs> this is fun. Okay, so now here's, here's the next piece. Ready? We pray, God, send revival. And then we discipline ourselves into being holy. <laughs> That's backwards. Because you cannot ever pray. You cannot ever. Huh, whoops. Uh, yeah, that's right. God, send revival. God, do it. A thousand prayer meetings, a thousand hours. God, send revival, send revival, send revival. And you know what he says? I already did. And then we work so hard. We work and 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 we work trying to get holy. So we birth a system of works and we live it out in fear and manipulation and control. And God says, no, you have it backwards. You're supposed to pray for me to make you holy and then you will become revival on earth. Our prayer meetings should not be focused on God send revival because he already sent you. You are revival. You are the instruments of God's presence on earth right now. And we're like, God, send revival. And he goes, I did start living in it. 
He said, I want to make you look like me. Because when we pray for him to transform us, it destroys works and gives us grace. And when we become revival, it destroys fear and we begin to activate faith. But guess what? There's a gap right here. You want to know what this gap is? This gap is called... This gap is called reformation. It's the distance between who we're supposed to be and what we can become. And see, a lot of us have built... <laughs> I said it was going to get offensive... It may take a very bad turn right now. Buckle up. So what we did is we built seven mountains. And we tell people that if they could just get to the top of it, God could use them to change the world. But you have a savior that was born at the bottom of it, not at the top, and transformed everything you know today. Because, see, we're not supposed to lead from mountains. We're supposed to worship from them. Fix your eyes. Where does my help come from? See, the problem is we've built ladders. And anything you could do without prayer isn't God. There's no such thing as a business apostle. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a business place or marketplace prophet. There are only apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. Let me put it to you this way. If we had no hierarchy and we had no structure and we had no business cards, how would you find apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists? How would you find them? If it wasn't on their business card and you didn't visit their church and they didn't tell you they were one, how would you find them? How would you find them? They would have to actually live out of their anointing and not out of their position. We have a lot of people talking about marketplace apostles that have no money. <laughs> I love people who preach marketplace, marketplace apostles and they've got no money in their bank account but think they have a lot of influence. Don't give me that junk. Reformation doesn't look like mountains. It looks like this. It looks like a house. And it looks like a family. Because where we're building mountains for ourselves to stand on, God is trying to build a home that we can live from. God says this, I use the weak. I use the meek. I use those who are last and those who are lost to change the entire planet. Because guess what weak and meek and last and lost people need? Jesus. I think we've got a bum picture of what reformation and revival look like. Because guess what reformation was made for? Reformation was made for the church. And revival was meant for the world. Reformation is what happens inside the body of Christ. Revival is what happens out there when we live in reformation. Because when we look like the very thing we say we love, then people will come to us instead of us trying to talk them into coming to us. I've shared this here before. But I was standing in Disneyland, and I was looking down. The Holy Spirit, to, I, was, I used to have a season pass. I don't want to get into it, but I, I, I love Disneyland. And so I was standing there thinking about all that a man named Walt Disney had created. And I was standing on Main Street, and I was looking down towards the castle. And as I was looking down towards the castle, the Holy Spirit said, you are standing in a sketch from another man's notebook. And then he said this, don't you, don't you think that I gave this to one of my kids first? 
hear that. Don't you think I gave this to one of my kids first? And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit goes, Apple computers, science, astronomy, all of it starts popping in my head. All the sciences, all the math, all the innovations that have taken place over human history. And God said, I'm not just looking for someone who can do it. I'm only looking for someone who will say yes. See, I bet some of, okay, look at, you want me to prove this true? Very easy. How many of you have had an idea and all of a sudden you saw that idea on TV and somebody else is making money from it? Just show your hands. Raise your hands. No, no, literally put your hands way in the air. You, okay, look, look around. No, put them up and look around the room. That is proof that what I just said is true because you missed a moment where God wanted to give you influence in a realm you didn't understand. And all you got was the dream and the idea and your next thought was, I don't have the money and I don't know what to do with it. That's called reformation. You see what I'm saying? He takes the weak things of the world, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. You got influence in a realm you should never have influence in. God took Moses, a shepherd and a murderer, and made him an interior decorator. He said, and the purple curtains will come down to the ground. They will be made of this fabric, and they will be this wide. And Moses is like, what? And then you will build a candlestick. Okay, all right, candlestick, got it. Okay, okay, all right. You guys, he turned a shepherd into an interior designer, gave him an influence and a realm for the tabernacle because God had an idea that had to be manifest on earth, and he wasn't looking for someone who was qualified. He was looking for someone who said yes. And while we're so busy trying to climb the world's corporate ladders, we are missing a moment to influence a generation. Because influence and favor doesn't come by working hard. It comes through grace. That's why it's so frustrating to us when somebody gets it. <laughs> right? You're like, how did they? I've been literally doing this for 10 years longer. And look at what they're doing. I cannot believe this is happening. I, I deserve that. I should have been doing that. I should have been me. Why is it not happening? That's called unfair favor. Okay? It's called influence in realms you probably have more authority in. Do we understand why? We don't know why. And we're not supposed to know why. We're actually not supposed to know why. Because what we're looking for, can I help you out, church? We are looking for We're looking for presence. But guess what you need to have presence? You need to be See, most of us are praying for his presence, but we're not even present in the moment we're in, so no wonder we're missing it. We're so busy tweeting about the moment, we missed the moment. We're so busy filming the moment, we missed it. By the time we're done filming it, the moment's gone. We're so busy trying to manage it. We're so busy trying to organize it that by the time we got it organized, it's gone and passed us by. You want his presence? Start being present. You want to transform your house? Start being present. Ask what you have in your hands, not what you wish you had tomorrow. Look at what you have today and learn how to invest a moment. Learn how to invest where you are. Learn how to invest what we already have so that we can be present, so we can be stewards of his presence inside of a family because that's what this thing looks like. It looks like a family. Let me prove it to you, and I'm going to finish with this last story, the story of David. Last thing. I want to talk to you about the story of David, and I want to talk to you about a little box that kept God's presence in. Huh. It's called the ark. Now, the ark was sitting... The ark was sitting at a place called... Gibeon. It was sitting in the tabernacle, built by Moses, hidden behind the Holy of Holies. Now, here's where the story goes. The story goes that the Holy, it was inside the Holy of Holies. Eli's wicked sons, the Philistines, came to attack Israel. And when they did, they, Eli's wicked sons went into the Holy of Holies, took out the box, and they thought, I have a good idea. Let's take God in a box, put him out on the field, and he'll have to fight for us because we're Israel and the Philistines are evil. Guess what happens when they took God out of the place that he belonged and put them where he thought he should be? The enemy won 
and their army was completely wiped out. Eli's sons died, and so did Eli. In fact, one of Eli's sons was being born. One of Eli's sons had a child that was on the way. And by the time the, mo- the wife got the news, she cried out, we will name this son Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory of God has left. And the presence of God left the people of God because they tried to manipulate God for their own gain. You guys, I believe Jesus went to the temple and made a whip and whipped everyone in that temple for the same exact reason. Because we are so busy trying to tell God what to do, we forgot to ask God what he's doing. So, the ark goes on the Philistine world tour. It's very beautiful. The ark first goes into the city of Ashdod in the temple of Dagon, and they take, that, they take God in a box, they put it inside that temple, and they go, wow, this was a good day. We got the God in a box, and we beat the Philistines. High five, or we beat Israel. High five, we're the Philistines, we're dope. Amen, go to bed. They go to bed, they wake up the next morning, and Dagon is on his Dagon face. And Dagon is on his Dagon face, and they go and try to hoist him up. So they go that morning, they hoist up, hoist up Dagon, it probably takes a whole day, because they don't have cranes, they don't have any of that stuff. They jack him back up, he's standing back up, they're like, woohoo, Dagon's back up, God's still in a box, we beat Israel, we're awesome, good night. They go to night the second time. They wake up the next morning, and not only is Dagon on his face, his head and his hands are completely chopped off. And you think, oh, that's an interesting story. No, what happens is you invite God into your, into your body. You invite God into your body. And what is your body called at that point? The temple of the Holy Spirit. So when you invite God into the temple of the Holy Spirit and your body becomes a temple, guess what he starts doing? Moving around furniture. And we're like, yay, praise God. I want him to move around the furniture. I want him to set me free. Until you lose your job, lose your ministry, lose that thing that you love, your bank account's empty, and you're left crying in a corner in a fetal position wondering how you got here. And so what do we do? We go back. We fight for our position. Go put that car on a lease. We go back and we buy a boat. We go get a bigger house and we tell everybody that was the glory of God. The problem is when you turn back around this time, not only has he knocked it all down, he chopped its head and its hands off so that you can't go back to it. Anything that you love more than God is an idol. Anything you consult before you consult God is an idol. Anything. So the next day what happens is they get boils in places that we can't actually discuss because that's gross. Um, But you can read about it in the Bible. And they take that box, they take God in a box, and they take it to the next city. That next city takes it, boils break out there. They take that box, try to take it to a third city. When they take it to a third city, when they try to take it to Ekron, the people of Ekron look at the city, look at the God in a box coming, and they yell, No, don't bring it here. You're trying to kill us. Could you imagine if the glory of God is coming into a room and you're like, no, we're all going to die. Because that's what it says. It says that what was resting on the people was the kabod. Do you know what kabod is? Glory. The glory of God is a deadly thing to mess with. They said the glory of God rested heavy there. We're like praying for the glory of God to come. Why? Because I get that we're on the other side of the cross. I get that we're in a new covenant. I get that we're covered in the blood. I get that we have access to the throne room. But this is not a game. This is God. And we need to stop treating it like it doesn't matter. We have to stop treating it like we have no respect for it. I want to sing the song I like in the volume I like, the way I like it, with the words I like. And if the words aren't on the screen and the temperature isn't right and the seat isn't comfortable, I'm going to a different church because this is all about me. This is not about you. It is about the glory of God. It's about the presence of God. And the reason people out there have no respect for God is because the people in here have no respect for God. They're doing this because they learned it from us. And nobody says anything. We just have another prayer meeting and hope revival shows up. Praise God. (laughs) In fact, it gets worse. Because finally they decide, heck, this box, this box is trouble. Let's take this thing, let's pack it up, and let's send it back to the people of God because I don't want it anymore. (laughs) 
And so they get a new calf because they said, if it's really God doing this to us, and it's not just a coincidence, we'll put a new calf on a new cart. And if that calf, who's still nursing, turns around and comes back to the mom, we'll know it's all coincidence. If that calf walks away from a mom while it's still nursing and goes back to the people of God, we'll know it's God. Guess what that cow did? Right toward the people of God. And not only just to any people, guess what city it went to? The city of the Levites. Guess who the Levites are? The people who are supposed to know how to minister to God. Guess what happens when they see the box coming? They offer inappropriate sacrifices. And on top of operating in inappropriate sacrifices, they open up the ark to see if God's okay. Well, we better make sure God's okay. He's been gone for a long time. You better, we don't know if he can take care of himself. You guys, we are so busy defending God, we forgot he's our defender. Not once in the Bible are you ever, ever, ever God's defender. Well, no, brother, the Bible says that we're supposed to be prepared to have an answer. That's way different than thinking it's your job to defend God. Well, brother, there's atheists out there, and I've never seen one person get saved in debate. You ever seen that? That's weird, but we just keep doing it. Like if I yell at you loud enough and I have enough right answers, you're going to, you're just going to give yourself to Jesus. Yeah, because that's why I got married. What? (laughs) You think God's up there like, oh my God, he's an atheist. (laughs) Now they're cloning. I don't even know what to do. I didn't think that was going to happen. So somebody help. Help! I'm only God! <laughs> have, you guys, have you guys seen A Case for Christ yet, the movie? Oh, I just sobbed through the whole thing. Dumb Christian movies. I just, I wept through the whole thing. Because everything, I just kept thinking, he's real. Oh my God. Because guess what the Bible says? Those who seek, find. So guess what happens when you stop seeking and you think you found? You stop finding. We are seekers forever. Seekers are not the lost people out there. The seekers are in here. Well, bro, we got to go find the seekers. No, we don't find the seekers. I'm a seeker. We're all in the same boat. They opened that box and it says, depending on your translation, seven to 70,000 died that day. 70 to 7, uh, seven to 70,000 died that day because they did not understand or have a respect for the presence of God, even though they were the people who were supposed to have the greatest understanding of how to protect it. Now, after that, the ark gets put away for a while, quite some time, until a man named David comes along. A man named David comes along, and David shows up, and after he becomes king, his first priority is to get the presence of God back to the people of God. So he goes and gets the ark, and guess how he tries to get the ark? He gets himself a new cow, and he gets himself a new cart. Why? Because that's what worked for the Philistines. So they put that thing on a new cart with a new cow and they try to get it far and guess what happens? Uzzah reaches out his hand and guess what happens to Uzzah? Uzzah is dead. David said, well, this was a bad idea. He drops the ark out back off at Obed-Edom's house. You guys, why did the ark not, why did the ark, why did that cart not work? Because we are trying to bring the presence of God back to the people of God using the world's systems and it's not working. And we're doing the same exact thing today. Well, if we just, like, adopt some business structures from the world. No, 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 no. We don't need their systems. We are the greatest government in all of planet Earth. The world should be afraid of the decisions we make. They should tremble at how close we are to the living God. And that mobilized and powerful, we do not live under their government. We live under his You want to know why the Romans were so afraid of the church and wanted to organize them? Because there were too many of them meeting in houses and they didn't know how many they were. They just knew that they outnumbered their army and that terrified them. (laughs) Why? Because when they made a decision, they made it together and they transformed everything they touched. Today we are a laughing stock to the governments of the world. One governor said it this way, we love the church. My friend asked him, why do you love the church? Because if I just let them in my office to pray, they'll do anything I ask. We don't need the world systems. 
They need us. We don't need to beg for scraps from their table. We should be setting the table for them. Well, no, brother, as soon as we become governors, as soon as we become president, as soon, no, 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 that's it's a waste of your time. We could end abortion, end AIDS, end, end STDs, empty the foster care system and empty every orphanage, and we don't even need to vote on it, and we don't need a pro-life president. And it takes three steps. Number one, don't have sex till you're married. Number two, stay married to one person. Number three, teach your kids to do the same. You just ended abortion because there's no unwanted children. You ended AIDS and STD because there's no sex outside of marriage. And in one generation, you empty the foster care system and you empty every orphanage. And we only had to do what the Bible said. But the cost is too high. So we'd rather have 65 million hours of prayer trying to get it to stop instead of just living the way we were told to live. We could save ourselves a whole lot of money and a whole lot of time and be praying for a whole lot of other things if we just made agreement with the word of God. Well, Jake, that's very oversimplified. I know, it is. Why are we making this so difficult? We do the same thing with homosexuality. It's so ridiculous. You don't defend marriage by yelling at somebody else. You defend marriage by going home and fixing your marriage. Yeah, but that's a little too hard because there's a lot of stuff going on in my home. Yeah, go home and deal with that. No, you didn't make a mistake. No, you didn't marry the wrong person. You just have the wrong attitude. Fix your attitude and you'll fix your marriage. Oh, P.S. men, it's your job, not theirs. And you signed up for it the day you said you made covenant with that woman. And it is your job now to lead. And the moment she says, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore, you tell her, it's okay, I will be your husband for the rest of your life. And when you need me, I'll be waiting right here. Newsweek did an article about marriage. You know what they said? 90% of marriages where the husband just decided to stay, secular article, 90% of marriages that were in trauma and the husband just decided to stay, they eventually fixed themselves and course corrected without counseling. Simply because the husband loved his wife the way Christ loved. The Bible gives us this stuff, you guys. This isn't rocket science. We just don't want to do it because we've preached a gospel of comfort and conformity for so long. The new, the actual gospel actually hurts us when we hear it. The real gospel is offensive to the church because we've preached comfort and conformity for so long. The real gospel hurts us when it should empower us and convict us and transform us into the very image of the one we say we worship. So David gets the ark and puts it in Obed-Edom's house, and he says, forget it. But three months later, David gets a report. <laughs> you want to know what he gets a report of? That one house had the presence of God, and that house and that family were being blessed. Because one dad named Obed Edom decided instead of sticking the ark in a corner and not teaching his son how to steward it, you guys, Uzzah, do you know who Uzzah was? He was the son of the man who stewarded the ark while it was gone. But that ark, his dad never taught him how to steward the presence of God and respect the presence of God. So the moment the ark was, was wavering, he thought he could stick his hand out and save it. Because he had no honor and no respect for the presence of God. But Obed-Edom, that dude in three months got what that other family couldn't get in 20 years. Three months, church, three months, the presence of God rested in a home. And their blessings were so multiplied that the king of the entire nation got a report, hey, that house you dropped the ark off at, it's being blessed. The blessings are multiplying in the house where the presence of God is. And David goes, what? That should be ours. And I promise you, all it's going to take for the nations of the earth to come to us is one house being blessed by God and multiplied when there's no other reason except for his presence. And then David goes, maybe I'll read the Bible. <laughs> That's a good, good word right there. Don't worry, I'm almost done, and then you can go. It'll be nice. <laughs> he 
He reads the Bible, and he goes, oh, we need priests with poles. That's what we need. We need priests with poles. We need Levites, and we need poles. That's what those little hooks are for the side. So what we need is we need to get poles, put them through there, and we need to put them up on the Levites' shoulders. So he goes and gets himself some Levites, and he goes and gets himself some poles, and he runs back over, he runs back over, back to the house of Obed-Edom, and these people are terrified. Hmm. Why are they terrified? Because the last Levites who handled the ark, they all died. And then Uzzah just tried to get near the thing and help a brother out, and that thing killed him too. No wonder the Bible says they put the poles in, they put it up on their shoulders, and it says every six steps they stopped, dropped the ark, and offered a sacrifice to God. You know why? Most of us are like, oh, okay, yeah, one, two, three. No, this is what happened. They went like this. Okay, all right, just back up, all right? Just give me, give me some space. Oh, come on, man, okay. All right, here we go. Ready? Dude, seriously, I do not want to be turned to dust. Okay, here we go. Boom. Okay. One. We're still alive. Okay, this is good. This is good. Right, two. We're, okay. And we're three. Three, 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 three. Yeah, four. Five, 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 five. Okay, and we're at six. Set it down. Yes, we're not dead. Okay. <laughs> Offer a sacrifice because we are still alive. <laughs> Amen, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Woo! That was a good worship set. Let's do it again. Okay, here we go. Lift it up. 17 to 21 miles. This is how they did it. Every six steps, they dropped that ark and thanked God that they were still alive because they didn't deserve to be because they were standing in the presence of the living God. When was the last time you just stopped and thanked God that you were alive? Like literally, trembling before God, thanking him that your molecules weren't just splitting into a thousand different directions. Because they shouldn't be held together. Science can't even tell you why all your molecules aren't being held together. Science can't explain that. Science can't explain black matter. Science can't explain, explain quasars. Silent, science can't explain black holes. Science doesn't understand why these molecules won't pass through these molecules even though they're same material at their very basic core. Why can't this pass through this? Science can't answer that, but my Bible does. It says that all things are held together in Christ Jesus. See, we have to begin to understand that we should be grateful for the very essence of life for life itself we should be grateful because we enter his courts with praise but we enter the gates with thanksgiving so we got to stop jumping over the gates and trying to break into the, the courts no wonder our worship has no breakthrough we're completely ungrateful but still entering into praise and wonder why it has no breakthrough we jumped over the gates ran into the courts and we wonder why he doesn't show up because we didn't walk through the gates of gratefulness and here's the crazy part. They pick that thing up. They walk it 17 miles. And just as they get outside the city, there are watchmen on the walls of a city called Jerusalem. And they are looking down, and they see the ark coming. And these guys down here, they see the walls. And they're like, yeah, we are almost home where the presence of God will be back with the people of God. And then there's a verse in Scripture. There is a psalm in Scripture that they begin to shout out, and you all know it. They're carrying the ark on their shoulders, and they shout out to the walls, be lifted up, you ancient doors. Be lifted up, you ancient gates, that the king of glory may come in. And the watchman on the walls, they turned around and said, who is this king of glory? And they shouted back, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And they dropped the ark, offered a sacrifice, picked it back up, and said, Be lifted up, you ancient gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. And they worshipped their way back into the presence of God. And when they got to those gates, David couldn't stand it anymore. He literally could not physically take it anymore. And we have a stupid story that we hear that, God, that David stripped down to his underwear. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That is not Bible, and that is not what happened. It says that David took off his outer garments, and what did he have on? An ephod. Do you know who wears an ephod? The priests. You know what David was saying? I don't want to be a king anymore. I just want to minister to God. I don't need my position. I don't need your applause. I don't need your titles. I don't need your money. I don't need anything. I just want his presence. Give me his presence. That's all I want. 
This is what I came for. This is what I was after. This is why I stayed in the cave for 16 years. This is why I ran from Saul. Because all I cared about was this moment right here where the presence of God is back with the people of God where it belonged. Where are the Davids in this generation who don't care about applause, who don't care about position, who don't care about authority, who don't care if they've got the microphone, but they care about the presence of God. And the moment they're given a place of authority, they throw it off and say, I've got an ephod on. I'd rather be a priest. And then David does something even crazier. He goes even buck wild. He just gets nuts. And what he does is he finds another hill. He finds a hill called Zion. <laughs> Zion. Zion. And he sets up a tent. And he puts God God's presence in that tent. And he says, forget the way it used to be done. We can all come before the presence of God and we can all worship. 24-7, 365. And you're like, wow, that is so beautiful. Except for there's one problem. David broke the entire book of Leviticus to do that. He broke, and who wrote the book of Leviticus? God. Who made the laws? God. Whose laws were they? God's. So who was David coming against? God. And you know what God did? He said, I like it so much, let's do it again. Because all I was looking for God at his core, he never wanted the law. He wanted our heart. And David looked right through the book of Leviticus. And he said, I know what God wants. He wants me. He wants me. And he wants you. He breaks all the law and finds God's heart. And here's... Here's the crazy part. It says, so David left Asaph and his brothers there before, before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister regularly before the Ark as was required each day. So now Asaph and his family, guess where they are? Here ministering. And guess what it says in verse 38, church? Here's a guy we recognize. And also Obed-Edom. And his 68 brothers. <laughs> because one family member decided to steward the presence of God, the entire family got access to God's presence. <laughs> God's not done with your family. You are the answer. You are the answer. I don't care if you're nine or 90 in this room. You are the answer to a broken family line. You are the answer to what God wants to restore in your generational inheritance. You are the answer. You are the answer. Don't wait for somebody else. You're the answer. Steward the presence of God. And your 68 brothers, guess where they'll be? Right by your side. While Obed-Edom and the son of Jebulun and Hosea were to be gatekeepers. And then he does something ridiculous, and this is where we'll end, and I'll give you a little list and we'll be finished. He says this, Then uh, he left Zadok, the priest, and his brothers before the tabern tabernacle of the Lord at the high place of Gibeon to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offerings regularly morning and evening and to do all that was written in the law of the Lord that he commanded. He sent an entire family back to this tabernacle to continue ministering to it. But what is this tabernacle missing? What is this tabernacle missing? It's missing the presence of God. David literally had them go back 
and minister day and night in a tabernacle that had no presence. Oh, okay. Because David was stewarding the new thing while honoring the old thing. You want to know what the difference is between reformation and rebellion? Reformation says live in the new thing, honor the old thing. Re rebellion says do the new thing, burn down the old thing. That's rebellion. That is rebellion at its core. Ugh! And here's the craziest part. Here's the crazy part, church. so ridiculous how good God is, okay? Look. David, the very next chapter, it says this. He looks out at the tabernacle. He just built it. Worship going on day and night. You know what he says? How is it that I'm in a palace and God is sitting in a tent? I'm going to build God a house. God tells him, no, you're not going to build a house. Your son is. So guess what David does? He spends the rest of his life making sure that his son succeeds. And guess what happens? They take the presence on this tabernacle and they take the tools at this tabernacle and we get a double portion anointing one generation later because David was willing to live in the new, honor the old, so he gave his sons both. So what does it look like? It looks like this. You want to know the difference between this and this, I'm going to give you a list and we'll be finished. This is family. This is an organization. And they have different value systems. And this is the difference. One is a destination. The other is a launching pad. One, one maintains while the other mobilizes. One supervises while the other supports. One values conformity. The other values creativity. One values the congregation while the other values kingdom. One value, one, one employs people, the other just empowers people. One is passive, one is active. One, hmm. one is content. We're totally okay with where we're at. The other is courageous. One avoids while the other attacks. And lastly, one spends their money on operations while the other spends their money on outreach. And Jesus put it this way. He said this. He said, you don't pour new wine into an old wineskin. Because if you do, the wineskin itself will break and the wine will spill to the floor. But instead, you pour new wineskin into what? Or pour new wine into a new wineskin so that, how does the verse end? It doesn't end there. It ends, so that why? Both are preserved. Church, he is doing a new thing. We are living in a third reformation reality where he is building a family on the planet. And you have an opportunity to start by going home and fixing yours. And you have an opportunity tonight to be a part of something that can literally transform the way the world views the church, views the kingdom of God, and views God himself. But the cost is very 
very, very high. And I have heard from too many major leaders in the body of Christ. I would love to do this. And I think you might be right. But my ministry is just too big to change now. And then they say this. Will you please do it? And I want to ask you tonight, can we please do this together? Please. I'm asking you, as a friend, as a brother, let's do this, please. I don't want my kids to have to repeat history. I want them to write it. And I'm not going to doom them to the same systems that tried to entrap me. And I will tell you this, leaders, lay people, family, that if the only people you ever win to Christ are your own kids, you did an awesome job. And you should be darn proud of what you've done. If you never preach one single message, but your life is the message, I promise you, you'll change the planet. So we ask Holy Spirit, this weekend will you convict us and comfort us? We start by repenting. for wrong thinking, wrong motives, and maybe even wrong motivations for coming to this gathering, thinking about what we get out of it instead of what we can give. Maybe someone will pray for me. Maybe I'll get a prophetic word. No, what if I actually decide to look and live like Jesus Christ? Maybe we need to stop doing altar calls where we come up and take something, and instead an altar call is where we come to die. Altars are not where we go to take something. Altars are are where we go to lay our life down. And maybe it's time for us to start answering real altar calls, laying our lives down for the sake of the gospel, laying what we think our callings are, what our giftings are, what our titles are, and just like David, throw them to the ground and dance before God and say, this is the thing I always wanted your presence. And God, we ask tonight, help us be present. Help us be present. In Jesus' name, amen.